Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we will be talking to Ignacio Alamillo Domingo. He is one of the leading thinkers about identity and SSI, and he's based in Spain, but he works extensively in, in, in the whole European space and in the global space um, um, for SSI, but also for many years now, in the, from the very early beginnings with, in the 90s with PKI, and he will tell us more about all the interesting things he has done during this time. So I'm really happy to have a Spaniard here with us today because I'm a half Spaniard myself, and, and it's cool to have someone with us who can share what, what Spain is doing in the, in the space on, on, on very interesting high levels. For those people that have not joined SSI Meetup before, let us quickly review what we do in the next slide. And um, I would like to share what, what SSI Meetup is about. So basically at SSI Meetup, what we try to do is to empower global SSI communities. And this is open for everyone. So if you're an association, a company, an individual, anywhere in the world, and you want to learn about SSI, this is the place to go. And because all the material we share is created with the creative commons by share like license and this means that you can reuse this material in any way you want so you just go you can download a google slide presentation or watch the videos and learn about the stuff and the only thing you have to do is to give credit back to the person um sharing the material which today is um Nacho Lamillo. and also please give credit back to ssi meetup the, this stuff is being reused all around the world from Canada, South America, Africa, and Asia. So we're really happy with the outcome. SSI Meetup has been around now for almost two years. It's our birthday very soon, or has been. I don't remember now exactly. So we're really happy that people around the world are using this, and that's the whole goal. And um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to intervene. You have a question tool where you can just write your question into a chat, and I will bring up those questions to Nacho uh, whenever they're pertinent. If not, we can also cover those questions at the end of the presentation, we really encourage that because it's a really good opportunity to have access to experts like Nacho and to ask them your questions and thoughts directly and through, through this method. So I really encourage that. Um, and without further ado, thank you so much, Nacho, for joining us today and welcome to SSI Meetup. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, th thanks uh, first for the invitation to contribute to this very, within this very interesting space. Um, here you have just a, a small review of my, my background. I'm, I'm essentially a lawyer with a PhD thesis regarding the legal aspects of the electronic identification and services uh, European regulation, which is the so-called EIDAS regulation. Um, I'm a sub-member of several uh, standardization committees working now on the blockchain, especially, uh, especially in, in the field of electronic identity. Um, so I'm co-leading a study uh, about trust tankers for decentralized identity management, which is a hot topic right now in ISO TC307, but I'm also co-leading a new technical report, um, which is a kind of overview of uh, how we use DLT systems for identity management. And if any of you are involved in standardization activities, I kindly invite you to contribute to these uh, topics, because right now uh, we are starting to build a global standard uh, to be able to uh, yeah, do, uh, enter into SSI-based relationships all around the globe. So this is going to be uh, a hot topic for, for the future and therefore um, probably it will be important for, for you in any community, um, even if not informally involved in formal standardization to try to contribute. And finally, I'm, I'm, uh, I, con I have a contract with the European Commission um, to help them to analyze the interplay between the, this regulation, the, the electronic identification to services regulation uh, here in the European Union, with uh, the uh, self-sovereign initiatives we are trying to build in the European Union for the interchange of data between public administration, citizens and companies. So, um, some, some of the thoughts I'm going to present today are really uh, outputs of the of this project for the European Commission, because we have the we are in charge of thinking on how we can uh, get more legal effect for uh, uh, verifiable credentials of different ways. Of course, uh, all these uh, thoughts are our own. This is not something which has been formally endorsed by the European Commission. You know how these works are. So it is more a bunch of uh, good ideas we are exploring. We are having uh, really interesting conversations with the European Commission officers and also with the conveners of the EVSI project, which is the most important initiative in the European Union right now to create a blockchain services infrastructure with real use cases, including identity. 
And uh, of course, we're really grateful for the opportunity we've been given to, to be able to explore the legal challenges to create, uh, you know, verified credentials which are legally enforceable. Uh, I've been reading in some blogs that uh, the, the, there is a new expression uh, called legally enforceable SSI identity systems, which is interesting because it is less identity than uh, with the previous systems. But it is true that this is showing the a real interest by the leaders of this space, not to have uh, just systems based on social trust, but also having systems based on the law, uh, because then it, it, it will be easier for all of us to use this kind of new technology in, in real businesses, especially in regulated spaces. So uh, what we, I will be presenting today is first uh, a real, uh, well, just a small in brief introduction to what self-sovereign identities are, uh, just as an introduction to what we have to discuss. Then I will be focusing on the need of trust when it comes to the usage of verified credentials. I will try to convince you about the need to reuse the previously existing legally trust frameworks we have. I, I know that this is a polemical topic because there are a lot of people saying that we should not rely on previously legal systems but just create a new one. And then we will go into the main uh, trust uh, legislation we have in the European Union, which is of course the EIDAS regulation because the main objective for, for, for today is try to have a look at how can we reuse this uh, legal uh, piece of uh, you know, code we have right now in place uh, with the new technology uh, to empower citizens uh, and at the same time to uh, have a legal proof of all the actions that are based on, on you know, self-sovereign identity systems when used in real business uh, opportunities in the world. So, um, first of all, um, as uh, I'm, I'm sure you will be quite familiar with this, uh, so the concept of self-sovereign identity is interesting because it is a kind of the, the next step in, a, in an evolution we, we've had during uh, roughly 30 years right now in the identity space. In fact, the, if you remember uh, when PKI stuff um, were put into production, and I remember 25 years ago, roughly, we were starting to put into production the first certification authorities in, in, real, in real business out of the academia. Uh, when, when it comes to PKI, um, you, you have uh, an identity system which is pretty similar to the, the topic of autonomy we want to reuse in, 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 this, in this system. So you create your own keeper, and with your own keeper, you are able to uh, identify yourself when you receive a credential, which is called a digital certificate. This is interesting because when you authenticate yourself by using a digital certificate, you are autonomous and you are not uh, surveilled by anyone. So there is no third party that is looking at what you are doing. But the problem with PKI certificates is that uh, you cannot decide which information do you want to share. First of all, because you, you, when you present the certificate, uh, the relevant party is receiving all the information, so you cannot, you don't have a minimum disclosure principle. And the other problem is that, in terms of identity, it is what it is called an early binding identity proofing system. That means that the it is the CA that must identify you previously uh, to for, for you to identify against third parties. So your identifier is in fact created by the uh, trusted third party, by the, by, by the certification authority. That means that we have some pros in these systems, but we also, also have some cons, some problems, because if the CA is hacked, someone is able, anyone is able to impersonate your identity, and the trustworthiness of the system is, uh, is you know, destroyed. And we've had some problems in, in, the, in recent years with some hackings of certification authorities, so we are trying, trying, trying uh, a lot to uh, high, uh, heighten the, the security of certification authorities. For these, there are for us, such as the CAF Forum, uh, creating very strict policies. But the system is not quite good, as, uh, as we will see with self sovereign identities. On the other hand, uh, more recently, uh, federated authentication appeared. And by using protocols such as uh, SAML, 
or protocols such as OpenID, we were given the possibility of reusing our password-based authentication systems with different third parties. So, um, using the ASAML approach, I was uh, now I'm able to uh, extend my authentication system, uh, given for instance by the government, to be entered into a relationship with uh, different uh, different companies or different governments. And this is because uh, when I want to connect to a relevant party, the relevant party will resend me to the ITP, the identity provider, which is a trusted third party. I will authenticate myself using my password against this the third party and then the successor party will vouch for me will grant issuing a saml ticket or an open id ticket uh, asserting my identity which i will pre pre be presenting to the relevant party so i will be uh, accepted by the third party by, by the relevant party sorry because there is an idp saying that i am nacho and this is quite good if you want to share your password without do actually doing it, if you want to extend password-based authentication system. Um, but uh, And it is also quite good if you want to uh, have some user centricity and if you want to select which information do you want to disclose. But believe me, it's really bad, as we will see, uh, in the sense that, uh, for instance, uh, this IDP is able to reveal what you are doing. They are, it is able to uh, store lots of metadata about your digital life. It is subject to potential uh, the denial of service attacks. And uh, of course, it is uh, potentially um, uh, subject of uh, an identity steal attack because they have a central database with all the identity information. So again, with SAML or with OpenID models, we have some quite good uh, pros of the for, for the system, but we don't have, um, okay, we also have cons. And I didn't say it, but uh, of course, uh, in the case of an IDP, uh, your identity is fully dependent on, on this IDP. If the IDP decides to erase your account or to cancel your account or to suspend your account because they consider you have breach the contract, then uh, you, you don't have the possibility to, to avoid it. So your existence is based on the contract. And this is uh, something which is really weird and it's really dangerous. So when, so when I discovered uh, the self-sovereign identity approach, I was really, really convinced that we, we were mixing, getting a system, mixing the both, the, the best properties from the PKI system and the best properties from the uh, delegated authentication system. Because in this case, it is true that I will be able to manage my identity because we will be having a system based on a cryptography I can control, first of, of, of all. So in that sense, it's similar to a PKI. I will be able to get credentials. So again, like in a PKI, then I, I will that I will be able to store and share with uh, any party I want to. But it will be better than a PKI because I will be able, you know, to uh, get my identifier before getting any credential. So I'm not being identified first and then I'm being able to authenticate. Uh, on the contrary, as we will see, I will be able to create my identity first, my identifier using a decentralized network. And therefore, then using a late binding identity proofing system, I will be able to get one or two or any uh, number of identity credentials. So it is better than PKI. It is similar because I have autonomy and I have control, but it is better because uh, I, I, I am able to exist before getting any credential and the most important thing, I am able to decide which information I want to share. So this is uh, something I, uh, you can see in this slide when you look at what uh, Christopher Allen told us in, in, this, in this 2016 uh, really interesting block entry, when he was saying that self sovereign identity was the next step beyond user centric identity, you know, SAML approach and OpenID approach, and uh, it means that begins at the same place, which means the user must be central to the administration on, on ident of identity. But the difference is that a true control of that digital identity um, is central to the new system because it, it's going to create user autonomy. So in, the, the, in, the, in this sense, uh, Chris told that a self-sovereign identity should be transportable. So the principal uh, characteristic of this new system is that the, it cannot be locked down to one site or local. 
and it is exclusively under your control. So it is true that uh, here we are mixing things because, because it is the end of an evolution, probably as per today. We don't know what will be happening in the future, but we are really creating a system with the best uh, properties of uh, what we've been doing the last 25 years, to say the least. Just the best properties from PKI, best properties from um, SAML uh, or OpenID approaches. So here you have an, an, an illustration which is taken from this uh, uh, computer science review uh, magazine number 13 from Professor Muller. Um, here you can see a really, really um, simplified uh, architecture for an SSI system. Here you can see that we have in the center the user agent and the user agent is, is, is uh, ba based uh, on, on a blockchain where it can register an identifier. We know that probably it is not going to be the, the, the main identifier, but probably a pseudonymous identifier that uh, is going to allow this person, this user to identify, to authenticate you by using this authentic, by, by using this ide identifier. This is typically what is called a decentralized identifier. Um, the, the, we, when, when this user is, has created their identity, probably he's going or she is going to ask for the issuance of verifiable credentials. That, that, that is, and you perfectly know about it, uh, small documents with uh, one or more identity attribute data, which must be warranted by someone. So probably uh, a government could be an issuer of a verifiable credential saying that my name uh, is Nacho, that my surname is Alamillo, that uh, my nationality is Spanish, that my civil vicinity is Catalan, and you know, these sort of things. Uh, at the same side, uh, the a company could issue a verifiable credential saying that I am a customer or whatever information uh, we, we are interested in, in managing. The idea is that uh, I'm going to receive, the user is going to receive these verified cred credentials and they, he is going to store it, to store the, these verified credentials in a mobile phone or a, or a type of device or even in the cloud. And secondly, the, and this is uh, the part which is new uh, from the perspective of the current uh, delegated authentication models based on SAML, the user is going to be able to present these verified credentials to any verifier. Here is when we where we have the the some sort of innovations. For instance, instead of showing my verified credential with my uh, date of birth, I could present a verifiable credential, which is called in the standards a uh, verifiable presentation, saying that asserting that I am older than eight, than 18 year old using a zero knowledge proof. This is quite innovative. Uh, when compared with the systems we are using right now, especially when we compare them with PKI technology, which is uh, really widely used for strong identity systems. So the, the idea is that we are using the blockchain for two things. One thing is for the existence principle, which means that we are going to use the blockchain to register as a register for this decentralized identifier, which is then only under my control. But we can also uh, use the blockchain to register uh, any claim we have received or we have shared with a third party. Of course, uh, it, this is a quite, quite, quite uh, simplified version. When you look at uh, more mature systems uh, right now, even operating in, in the world, you will see that uh, there are some uh, layers where we separate things, uh, for instance, to provide for privacy. Uh, but the whole the, this this uh, illustration shows quite pretty well how the system works, and I'm really interested on that because at the end of the day, if you look at here, you, we have an issuer that is issuing a, an information token which is going to be used by a verifier. So probably, um, if we want this to work in the real world, we have to think about how uh, about how do we create trustworthiness. Um, identity tokens, because if the verifier is not entitled to consume or to trust or to use the information which is included on a verifier credential, or if no one is liable for, for this action, probably the verifier is not going to 
uh, use this system for real world transactions. So probably we will need to discuss about trust even uh, in, in these uh, highly decentralized systems. Before I just want to resume the main SSI benefits we are looking at, um, because it is important for, for us to convince, especially uh, you know, policymakers, that uh, we should move from the previous identity management systems we currently have implemented, and believe me, they have cost a really lot of money, to these new systems. So probably we we, we must be uh, some yeah we, we we must try to convince them about the the benefits we are going to get with these new technologies um, be, to try to accelerate their buy-in, um, especially in 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 public uh, administration projects or in uh, regulated market projects such as in banking, for instance. So first benefit, um, and I already uh, referred to that, of SSI is that it reduces the risk of massive identity theft. This is interesting because, uh, of course, we are now used to get news uh, all the time about uh, big, big uh, bre data breaches that uh, uh, imply that uh, your identity has been stolen and someone is able to, to impersonate you. This is due because in many cases the central identity provider has a really big database with no so much uh, security, information security or cyber security measures and therefore it is possible for the crooks to just to enter and stole the information. This is something that, of course, could also happen in an SSI system, but as the information is really, really highly uh, uh, distributed, the, the possibility is, uh, is not, so how, not so high. Of course, someone can, can say that uh, my mobile phone application is also subject to an information cybersecurity attack. Uh, that could uh, result in, the, in someone stealing my identity. That might happen, yes. But it is not the same uh, as when the when we talk about a database with millions of uh, records. Because if you steal the full database, the damage is really really big instead of uh, of uh, stealing just one person identity. So in terms of um, exposure, we think that this reduces a lot this uh, this risk. So we think that it could be interesting to uh, move from the current systems uh, into these new new systems based on distributed identity. Second benefit is that uh, as the SSI identity provider, which is the issuer of the verified credentials, uh, are not intervening in the authentication process, they don't have information about your, your online uh, activity Thus means that they are, we are reducing the so-called big brother risk because these guys, they cannot see what you are doing with your credentials. That means that the, the GDPR compliance cost is also reduced because we don't have uh, to prove that uh, even being able to surveil the user activity when going authenticating online, we are actually not doing that. Also, and this is the third, the third benefit, uh, this new technology allows the user to decide which identity data to share, with whom and with which limits and constraints for the parties. And this is really, really, really interesting because uh, right now when we have a national ID card, for instance, and we want to show the national ID card uh, to prove our age, as I was saying before, the, the relevant party is getting all the information. I remember one of the European projects we've been working on, which is a project called ARIES. In ARIES, we were exploring the using the usage of derived identities in in airport uh, in airport use cases. One of the use cases we were discussing was the possibility of uh, making a bad exempt uh, buying in a in an airport shop, which actually implies that you have to show your boarding pass. Now, because of uh, taxation regulation, the, any, any, any shop that is going to uh, uh, exempt, uh, to, to buy products with that exemption must uh, verify your boarding pass and they must store a copy of all the data. This is something which is unacceptable because from the perspective of the, sh of the, of the, elect of the commerce, they are getting more data than needed and they are storing this data during five years. For instance, in Spain, 
which means with the, the year in cost and for uh, additional years per taxation regulation. I mean, this is something which is not good, nor for the user, which uh, is uh, excessively surveilled, nor for the e-commerce, because they have to uh, put some security and technical security and organizational security measures to be able to protect this information. So in that project, we were exploring the possibility of using zero-knowledge proof just to show the fact that you had a valid bought in pass for that day. So this is something we could implement with, with, with SSI solutions. Therefore, connecting, for instance, big databases where you have uh, your identity data, such as your fingerprints, for instance, with reliant parties that are going just to get a generous proof uh, showing that, you, you, that, that this is uh, your biometric data, for instance, or uh, showing that uh, you, you are a citizen of a country or whatever identity data we, we need to share. So from that this respect, it is a really better system compared to PKI and to SAML or OpenID models. And the most important thing, in my opinion, even if uh, in an SSI system there is the concept of revoking a credential, the idea is that the base identity, which is the decentralized ID, cannot be suspended nor revoked except by you. That means that your user account is not anymore depending on any business model. So this is something which is interesting because it's going to, it should allow us to end with what has been called digital feudalism, which means that uh, you enter into a territory, a, a digital territory, a digital land, which is owned by a big company. I will not be citing any name. But probably we are, we also, all of us have some names in, in mind right now. And then you sign a contract, meaning clicking in a button by signing. And then you get a user account and you have to abide to a contract. And if you don't comply with the contract or if the contract is, is changed, then um, you must uh, decide whether you want to be there or to was, just want to disappear. And this is something which is quite problematic because at the end of the, of the day, all our identity, which is formed by attributes and relationship between these attributes, are stored in a database owned by a company, uh, setting up the rules they want, they, they, they feel better for their business. And if they decide we should not be there, they just erase our identity at all. That means that uh, we are really on the hands of these companies. I, I'm not saying that they are here the, the evil ones, you know, but uh, I really don't like the idea of that my digital existence is based on the on something that is property of a company. So in, in, in my opinion, the best, best uh, benefit, the most important benefit we are going to get around the, by using, adopting this technology is that we are going to depend just on the network, just on the decentralized network and a distributed system. Of course, it doesn't mean that there are no uh, perils, there are no risks, but uh, believe me, the system is much better than depending on just one party. And those uh, mean that this uh, idea of uh, using early binding uh, identity proofing systems is, is simply end with this new technology. With SSI, I will be able just to create my identifier and to control my identifier, and then I will be able to select all the companies or governments or other uh, citizens to get information, identity information, and decide who I'm going to implement to share this information with. This is uh, just uh, uh, an example. With, it is a real um, SSI implementation we have uh, in Spain. It is led by Alastria, which is a uh, a uh, Spanish association uh, dealing with uh, identity projects and blockchain projects. It is not uh, owning a uh, production network, so it is not selling blockchain uh, network projects. It is a place where we meet to discuss and to create uh, common grounds for understanding and even pre-standards. And one of the most important projects in Alastria has been precisely the SSI uh, ID, self sovereign identity reference model to uh, foster the adoption of this technology by the partners of Alastria or by whatever the other parties want to use it uh, because we plan to learn by doing, you know. So, in this case, what you are seeing in the screen right now is 
more or less a pictorial representation of the processes of our uh, ident self sovereign identity proposal. Of course, it doesn't mean it is the best proposal in the world. It doesn't mean there are no other proposals in the world. So it's just uh, to, to, to have an example, um, because I want to explain to, to go into the trust theme. So in this case, the user, which is called Alice in this, in the, in this slide, um, is uh, able to produce to create an identity it is always which is based in this case on a on a on, on, on a network and it is derived identity is based on a key which is used to control the decentralized identifier and this that there is a, a registry based on the blockchain to uh, generate proof about the actions uh, Alice is going to do when using the system once Alice uh, has created her identity, she's able to go and uh, to the different issues, whether financial institutions, government, corporate institutions, or whatever, and uh, get credentials. Of course, uh, when getting a credential, Alice is going to register to ask for this, for this using a protocol. The protocol is going to come back with a response. The credential will be, will be stored by Alice, but uh, what we are going to do is to store a hash of this credential in the network because then we have a proof that this is an authentic record and when interchange with third parties there is traceability of course this is designed in a way which is unlinkable this is not something which is for, for today's presentation the technical details but the idea is that alice is going to be able to control her identity and to get as much credentials as she needs on the other side, she's going to be able to present one credential or a collection of credentials to a service provider in the context of a relationship. This presentation, uh, which is right now following the, the standards, uh, the emerging standards, I would say, from, from the community, um, is uh, also uh, protected. We're going to produce a, also a hash of this presentation to be stored in the blockchain. So anyone any person with the presentation is able to check the authenticity and the existence of uh, this verifiable presentation or any verifiable credential included in the presentation so this is how it works the important thing for me uh, it is not this but the fact that this service provider is going to rely on the issuer so probably that means that we need to discuss about trust here in this in, the, in this uh, additional slide, you will see more or less the same. But uh, in this case, we are uh, showing that we are producing different hashes for each transaction to avoid correlation. So this is what we talk about the privacy by design solution, which is uh, based on what we call private sharing multi hashes. That means that the hash produced over a credential by the issuer is different from the hash produced by a user over the same credential and of course the hash produced over the presentation by the user is different from the hash produced by the receiver when uh, it has to uh, acknowledge receive so the idea is that we have different independent hashes to avoid to prevent any any third party with access to the public uh, blockchain network to be able to trace back your actions so here we are using the blockchain for proof and we are doing it in a privacy enhancing way. Of course, there are other solutions in the world. As I was saying, the important thing for us is uh, to have a, some rules to allow the relying party to trust the content of the credential. Just uh, as, as uh, an informative, uh, in an informative way, this is an example of how we do represent a credential. Here you have a classic credential. In this case, we have the, the subject. We have the, at the attribute data, we have some issuance, some the issuance dates, and we have the issuer. Here we, you can see that we talk about, about the level of assurance. We, have, we, say, we are saying that this address has a specific level of assurance. This is about trust. This is something we, 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 we plan to introduce um, around the concept of a trust framework to be able to uh, convey assurance information about a credential. That means, in, in this specific case, that we have a substantial guarantee about the fact that this subject has this address. And this is something that might be simple, or it might seem simple, but it, it, it implies having a legal background 
and a legal framework and a trust framework to define the rules that will allow us to rely on whatever uh, level of assurance two means for you. We think that without this approach, it's going to be very difficult for line parties to uh, rely on, 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 on any, any credential because they, they, don't have, they won't have any liable for this. In, this in, in, in the next slide, what you are seeing is just a presentation. You can see here that there are uh, different credentials which are grouped in a presentation with the metadata. And of course, in both cases, we have the hashes, the, the corresponding hash to be able to uh, check the authenticity of this uh, presentation. Here, of course, in the presentation, we have, of course, the credential itself with the level of assurance. So, um, the fact is that um, in PKI, we have uh, we had the problem of trust. In SAML and in OpenID, we've had the uh, problem of uh, defining trust. And of course, we think that in SSI uh, solutions, we are going to have the same problem of trust. Because in our opinion, the, the fact of using uh, SSI systems do not essentially change the, the trust relations. And this is because at the end of the day, even if I, as a user, have the control of sh getting and sharing any type of credential, the fact is that uh, it is the reliant party that must trust the claim issuer. So if I want to open a bank account and I have uh, to prove the bank account has uh, due diligence, a customer due diligence, and I have they have to prove my real identity, if um, the credential I receive from the government is not trustworthy, it, it is it's not sufficiently trustworthy, the bank as a relying party will not be able, they will not be able to accept this uh, claim as proof. So at the end of the day, we even if the system is not connected, such uh, as in a SAML solution, where line parties are enter into direct relationship with claim or credential issuers, even if it, this is mediated by the user, the fact is at the end of the day, the relying party must take a trust decision. And this is essentially a risk decision. They will need to assess the risk. They will need to understand uh, what uh, level of assurance do they require. And they will need to uh, check this against the policy and the security policy of the claim uh, or very far credential issuer. If it matches, then they will be able to rely on this information and instead of uh, forcing you to come uh, in a presential way to show your national identity card, probably they will be able to uh, do a uh, remote identity proofing where you will be show, showing a bunch of uh, digital credentials. So at the end of the day, in SSI, trust relationships do not essentially change. We have the same problematic we, we've had uh, during 20 years and this is uh, both a problem and an opportunity because uh, of course we should be able to reuse all we've learned in PKI and, and we have regulated around PKI and two services and all we've learned in SAML or OpenID uh, approaches which uh, by the way is also ruled in the European Union in the uh, space of public administration procedures. So, in, in our opinion, one of the really big challenges for SSI is uh, how to deal with trust tankos. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the reality is that when it comes to, to uh, uh, credential and uh, use for electronic identification, uh, the fact is that we still need to identify to, to know the real identity of a deed subject. So, imagine that uh, I register a deed and I want to, uh, to enter into a relationship with a bank with my deed. Uh, of course, the bank will just uh, be getting the, my, my deed as a pseudonym. They, will, they won't be able to prove who, I, who am I. So from this perspective, SSI is not really a solution for them, which is a solution is the fact that we can uh, get, you know, verified credentials from governments, for instance. And this is just by way of, of example, a verified credential from a government which proves my real identity and then just share this credential with the bank acting as a relevant party. So if this credential is trustworthy enough for the bank, probably the bank will be uh, happy to consume 
these credentials instead of doing it in other way, especially if you go for a, a digital single market when we plan to allow and we have a directive for this uh, already approved by the European Parliament uh, and you know, the Council, we plan to uh, allow banks to open accounts with remote identification procedures. So these remote identification procedures must be trustworthy enough for them. Otherwise, if they, they are not able to prove compliance to the customer due, due diligence rules, uh, they, might, they, must, they, they might be fined or they might be um, you know, punished by the government. So probably, yeah, it is true that if we don't have a trustworthy um, verified credentials uh, tied to a, a subject control deed, we just cannot use uh, SSI for real businesses. And this is something which is the, that we have there and we have to, to look at, at it. This is why we think the, 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 there is a clear need to define governance frameworks for identity, especially for the users of SSI in legally binding transactions. Of course, uh, we think that there are also social trust frameworks that might be really interesting and really, really, really important in other spaces. But probably when it comes to processes where there are uh, lots of uh, high liability or when it comes to regulatory compliance, such as the case I was explaining of around KYC, the, you know, the know your customer stuff, then um, we need clearly um, legally based uh, governance frameworks that uh, generate legal certainty and reduce risk exposure for these companies. And here is when we start to see uh, specificities and different things from the other uh, scenarios. In PKI, we have created identity frameworks by using certification policies, by using, you know, certification practice statements, by having a legislation defining how you have to prove the identity of a person before issuing a qualified certificate and, and the like. And we have that in the European Union and we have this in many other European, uh, non-European countries. Uh, even in the United States, we have this sort of rules when it comes to the federal PKI, for instance, for, for federal employees. So there are lots of experience. In fact, we have published in, in, the, uh, in the ETSI, in the European Telecommunications Standard Institute, we have published a global report on, on trust services management, including PKI, all around the world. So there we have a very, very strong um, identity governance framework. On the other side, we have created also a very strong governance frameworks for identity, when, which are based in delegated authentication. The EID, as example, is a good one. So right now, the Spanish government is able to trust the, the German government when issuing an electronic credential based on SAML, because we have a specific regulation dealing with the, the, the rules the governments must comply and adhere to when issuing these electronic credentials. So we, we, we have intergovernmental trust inside the European Union because we have created an identity governance framework based on the interchange of uh, SAML assertions based on uh, national ID cards, for instance. So now we should be uh, probably thinking on creating the same thing, but for SSI. And here is when it comes to difference. So here we should be discussing about uh, rules uh, in a layered approach. For instance, of course, if I am a bank that must uh, rely on a credential issued by the government, we should put some rules in the verifiable credentials level. We should say, okay, your verifiable credentials should comply with some technical specifications, your verifiable credential should declare uh, the, the level of assurance, your verifiable credential should um, be tied to uh, a, a deed with some properties, and then this is the next level, because we want really to uh, to have uh, security properties around the the control of this deed by a person, which means that the number is really a pseudonym. That uh, if you have a two-layer approach, like when using peer deeds, this is traceable when needed. Um, if we want to prove control and the system is based on keys, then we have a level dealing with uh, how the user is going to create the keys, which type of device should be used, which kind of cryptography should we be using, and these sort of things. You know, the idea is that uh, your very credential is as good as your lead, as your deed, the, your deed is as good as your key management thing. 
and this is something that community are discussing a lot. But at the end of the day, uh, all of this is uh, really depending on the DLT, so probably we should also have some rules regarding trustworthiness of the DLT itself. At the end of the day, if we, if we anchor all these transactions and if we anchor your, the control and, and the proof of the transactions on a DLT, we should be really sure that this, that the, uh, this blockchain is trustworthy enough that the, it, the, the consensus mechanism used for you know, creating truth in a distributed way are, are good enough and these sort of things. So probably we will need to uh, go level by level trying to think on the contents of the rules we have to put in here to be able to, to yeah, to, to trust uh, the, the verified credential information. Because at the end of the day, the only valuable thing in here is the data itself, but the data is transported in the verified credential. This transport is really tied to, the, to a deed which is controlled by a person. So this is tied to key management and the whole structure is roughly tied to a DLT because deeds cannot exist uh, on, on its very, very, very existence with, with, without any distributed uh, technology uh, that supports them. Otherwise, they are not deeds anymore. They are not, we are not anymore in the SSI space. So here we have the four levels we think we, we should be dealing with when defining governance, identity governance frameworks for uh, getting uh, trust in, let's say so, regulated environments where legally binding transactions are required. And uh, in that sense, we like to talk about uh, trust tankos uh, because we, we have a lot of literature, we have a lot of experience dealing with different type of uh, identity with trust tankos, specifically cryptographic trustancos, but also data trustancos and even legal trustancos that can help us. So instead of uh, creating everything from scratch, well, the, the, the work we are doing is to try to reuse uh, the legislation we already have, because this legislation is embodying right now the uh, main rules for the identity governance we are doing in the European Union. Of course, I have to admit that this is a regional approach. Uh, the world is really much bigger than the European Union. But in ANCITRAL, which is an, uh, uh, an agency of uh, commission of United Nations for the codification of international trade law, they are working on an international legislation that is really similar to EIDAS that would help us to connect this kind of identity trust framework with other uh, regional approaches or other really interesting initiatives. I want to mention just the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, which is a really, really impressive uh, initiative. And therefore, we think that, uh, yes, having these identity trust frameworks at the regional level could help all of us when going into the global space if we uh, are more or less uh, compatible with uh, what uh, all of us are doing in ANSITRAL, which is this commission. So going going um, to this, yep. Ignacio, just just a little question because um, we still have some time going. And there's there's a question here from Wim, and he's asking, isn't the control over the private key the weak link? I can impersonate someone when having control over the private key. Yeah, of course. Of course, at the end of the day, this is something I, I was referring when I was talking about the deed and the deed level and the and the key management level. Of course, um, the system is as good as the control you have over your private key if your deed is controlled by a private key. And of course, this is an implementation detail. I've seen proposals, uh, some proposals to tie the control of your deed to uh, biometric authentication based on zero knowledge proof. This could well happen. There are some proposals there where they say, okay, we are going to do a biometric full identity proof each time you want to get access to your deed to get rid of the of the key management problem. But uh, it will depend. But but yes, I have to agree. So the control of your deed, if it is based on, on asymmetric cryptography, is as good as the control you have over the private key. This is why um, when it comes to level of assurance, 
we tend to think that uh, secure hardware is part of the of the solution, it's part of the infrastructure. So I should be able to create my keeper in a secure phone, for instance, with a secure element, you know, using the trusted platform module and this, this uh, very well-known thing we have there and that we use perfectly fine in, in PKI space, for instance. We should be able to use this and then to create our DIT. So here we should be reusing all the security knowledge we have uh, coming from the smart car world, assuming, as I assume, that it is not perfect, which is something that, that also has to, to be explained. Trust, trustworthiness level, levels are always uh, driven by risk management. So probably it's not the same when you have to do a commercial transaction than when you have to do a, a, you know, a public procedure or when you have to authenticate yourself in the context of uh, national security, probably it is it will be difficult to find uh, one solution fit all. But uh, yeah, I, I think I think if we use secure key management, uh, we we will be having properly trustworthy uh, trustworthy control over our deed, and it should be fine for uh, the major scenarios we are dealing with in our lives. But yes, of course, this is a good point. Great, thank you. Okay, so anyway, um, for, all, uh, for, for any of you that are not familiar with the EIDAS, this is a regulation that is dealing with, uh, with electronic identification and electronic trust services, which, is, which are not the same. I'm going to go through, through them. So probably here you just have some, you know, appraisals for this for this uh, regulation it has been considered as a major contribution to the European digital single market, which is nice, coming out from Deloitte in this case, and it is considered to be a right foundation for a true digital single market. This is uh, something which is, you know, kind of uh, uh, propaganda, but it is interesting because it is one of the uh, regulations that were received really really uh, positively by by companies because it, it 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 creates something new which is the possibility to reuse identity electronic identification means issued by governments uh, or on behalf of governments in different member states so it, it is a piece of legislation which is useful both from the perspective of when you have to enter into a relationship with a, a, a you know a government the European Union, but also in the future, it probably will be used, reused also when you have to enter into a relationship with a bank in the European Union. So, well, this regulation is uh, talking about mutual recognition of electronic identification means, that is, that I can use my national uh, electronic uh, ID card from Spain when accessing a uh, Belgium public body service. And, but, but the regulation uh, also regulates uh, trust services, including the, the issuance of qualified certificates. That means that we have a regulation for SAML uh, delegated authentication staff, and in the same regulation, we have also the regulation of qualified certificates. That means the PKI with legal value. And this is this is interesting. Query principles for EID, it is based on cooperation. That means that if we are able to embody uh, SSI in this regulation, we, it will be easier uh, to extend a national SSI system to the whole European Union, even to even to non-European, non-members, uh, European countries that are not formally members uh, of the European Union, because it is in the European economical space. It is based on reciprocity. Re that means that uh, uh, we we have to ask, to accept. Uh, all the uh, systems with uh, level of assurance substantial or, or high, so we we we, sh we are not mandated to accept uh, low lower levels of assurance systems. It is uh, mandatory only to access public service, but it could be extended for private services, which is really uh, the opportunity one of the opportunities we we see in this field. Um, it is based on sovereignty of member states to use or introduce means for EID, so it does. Here, no one is mandat mandated to create a national ID card. The regulation is about the reusing of the authentication capabilities of this national ID card when entering into a relationship with other public bodies in the European Union. And it, the most interesting part for, for, for us today is that the fact that it creates also an interpretive framework, which could be extended again um, to embody SSI systems. Here you just have the notified EID schemes. So 
as, as you can uh, get get a glimpse of uh, the lo lots of possibilities that uh, are today activated in the European Union. Most of them are based on on EID cards, so it is classical early binding government issued identity. But we believe that uh, this is going to uh, give us a possibility to reuse these systems to produce verifiable credentials for uh, electronic identification in the SSI space and also for verifiable attestations. And basically, when we talk about interoperability, here we have the classical SAML approach, where you have a member state that uh, is entering into a relationship with an identity provider of another member state. So if Natural Amigo wants to access uh, you know, um, um, a Belgian a Belgian service provider. I will go into the service provider. I will be redirected to my own member state. I will authenticate myself using my national ID card against the, the the Spanish node, and then I will come back to the Belgian node where I will present a token. And with this token, um, the Spanish government will issue a, a token, so times to assign tokens with a minimum data set meaning my name, my surname, etc. So the, the idea is try to reuse this structure, but uh, using SSI instead. So instead of using SAML or instead of using these protocols, the idea is try to reuse this, this framework, which is quite abstract, to uh, embody the new protocols from SSI. And when it comes to trust service, the, uh, the most important part here is the fact that we uh, have regulated the issuance of qualified certificates. Qualified certificate, which is based on PKI, is also confirming the identity of a person in connection of an electronic signature or the identity of a of an, uh, legal person in connection with the issuing of documents. So as you will see, we think that we can reuse this, uh, this qualified concept, this qualified certificate concept, also to embody a specific type of verifiable credential which should be used uh, to confirm your identity. So here we have two regulations. One regulation would allow public uh, bodies to issue verifiable credentials for electronic identification, and the other one would uh, allow private companies, um, if, they, uh, if they qualify as trust service providers, to issue SSI verifiable credentials that essentially are used for electronic identification in the context of uh, signatures, so in the context of transactions. So that means that we have a really a lot of uh, uh, already done good work that could be used to, uh, to foster the adoption of the SSI solutions instead of creating everything from scratch. Here you have a, a small glimpse of that. Here, this IDAS regulation is the main electronic identification trust framework we have in the European economic area. It is a building block of digital single market, so it, it means that it allows the establishment of a distance relationship with uh, in the e-government field. It might be extended for the recognition of EIDs uh, when entering into a relationship with private sector usage, such as banks and online platforms. And uh, here, it, it is the, the important thing. As it is, uh, it has a technology neutral approach. It could be easily uh, adopted, adapted for the usage of SSI system, which is uh, what we are really uh, doing uh, in this study for the European Commission. And of course, I have to say that this is work in progress. Uh, it is not just because I'm legally mandated to do it, to say it, but it is also because it is true. It is work on progress. We are showing just part of the results. Probably in the future, we'll be delivering a more comprehensive report. But uh, right now, the, we, we, we have been studying just a, a part of all the legal um, assessment, which is around uh, the, the uh, European self sovereign Identity Framework, which is a pilot, a use case inside EVSI. And here, uh, what we our objective is uh, to have a legal analysis of uh, all the new elements we have in a necessary solution. For instance, we are studying we, we uh, around the deed space, uh, what is the legal nature of ownership of deeds. So deeds are assets or are special kind of pseudonyms. Depending on the response, the legal regime is one or, or another. For instance, we, we think they are special kind of pseudonyms. And that means that they are covered under GDPR, they are covered under fundamental rights, so they should not be, uh, government should not be uh, authorized to censure your, your deeds. Uh, we, we plan to to look at other problematics around here, so uh, for, for instance, if deeds can be managed uh, by adults in case of minors, for instance, if they can be, if they can be deactivated, 
what is precisely the, le the legal regime of keys and, and wallets uh, to, to, be, to be able to understand um, if, if uh, this legal regime should be strict or should be if, if we should put some rules around, around the cryptography you are authorized to use for this or something like that. The same with verified credentials, we're analyzing what are the duties and responsibility of verified credentials issuers, holders and also verifiers, because everything around identity is about risk and liability. So it is really important uh, to understand how to model the contractual or no contractual relationships between all these parties, between issuers and verifiers. At the end of the day, as I've said before, if the verifier is not able to trust anything issued by the issuer, uh, because there is no liability, probably they, they they won't be using that. So if we want to go into uh, outside the experimental world and enter into the legal uh, transactional world, probably we we must understand how it is going to work and we, which are the liabilities all parties are willing to to accept. And of course, for this, it is important uh, for us to align any SSI solution, which is just a specific case, with the EIDA regulation. We are not saying that all verified credentials should be aligned with the EIDA regulation. We are saying that some specific types of credentials for use for some specific purposes could be aligned with this regulation, and therefore we will be having legally enforceable or more legally enforceable uh, verified credentials because we are going to reuse a legal framework, you know, the security rules, the interoperability framework, etc. And that means that probably we 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 should contribute some legal input to the trust framework of the solution. In this case, the legal trust framework around the EIDAS um, when it comes to level of assurance, some conform governance and conformity aspects, and and so on. And now we, we, we have to see just the use cases and some and some conclusions because uh, this is the part uh, we have already we have more advanced and it is interesting to get feedback from 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 all of you because at the end of the day this is a you know a construct and it is interesting for for us to to see what the community thinks about it and get get feedback. The, the first use case we we, we identified uh, with respect to the SSI and EIDAS is precisely the possibility of using a uh, previously existing EIDAS identification means or qualified certificate to issue verified credential. So the idea in this case is if Natural Amigo has, for instance, a national ID card which has been notified as an electronic identification means by the Spanish government in the context of the EIDAS with level high, by the way, because it, the, the security measures are really good, then the, the, the question is why should not be able to produce, to use this instrument for the identity proofing um, of the person uh, controlling a deed. That essentially means that uh, I will have a deed and I will have a deed control me mechanism that I will be uh, able to use to authenticate myself, but I also will have a national ID card. So if in the same session I produce both authentications, probably the, that issuer uh, has a pretty good uh, evidence that um, I am natural amigo. Therefore, probably this issuer uh, would be happy to issue a new credential saying, okay, this person's name is Nacho and this is uh, backed up by the, by the national ID card and I can issue a second credential saying Nacho is a lawyer. And, and at the end of the day, the credential saying uh, Nacho is a lawyer probably will be saying this deed subject is a lawyer. And when I the reference the deed subject, then I have a verified credential for identification saying this date subject name, subject uh, first name is Nacho. So that means that uh, here we are creating a world of derived identity, identity based credentials based on national ID cards to, uh, yeah, to, to give these uh, credentials back to Nacho to allow him to share these credentials with any relying party he wants to. So it is interesting because uh, these, these credentials would inherit the level of assurance of the EIS electronic identification means, at least regarding the information. So the fact that Nacho is Nacho is quite very well uh, proved. Of course, a different thing is the level of assurance associated to the deed control method Nacho has. So probably if the, if the national ID card uh, used by Nacho is level high, probably the credential produced uh, derived with the 
and give them back to Nacho would be substantial because it will depend on the on the device that Nacho holds. It will depend on the on the security techniques we use. It will depend on the security concession mechanism we have in the DLD, etc. The idea is that at least from the perspective of the data we are going to include in the credential, it is true that we are inheriting this identity proofing uh, coming from the state. So it, it is a, a, a interesting use case to be able to have a kind of first bridge between the existence of very good previously classic identification means and the new SSI identification uh, means based on verified credentials. The same could happen with qualified certificates. If I am a true service provider, we, I, I have a, the legal, a legal framework to identify people and to issue certificates. Uh, nothing, in my opinion, prevents a certificate to be used in form of a verifiable credential following the syntax and the protocols of SSI solutions. At the end of the day, the EIDA regulation is neutral from a technological perspective. It is true that the major standards we've built all these years are based on PKI, but nothing, again, pre again prevents a, a true service provider to decide that they are going to issue qualified certificates in form of a specific TIT method plus a very follow credential. So this, this is something that could uh, pretty well be done in, in uh, under the current DIDAS. So probably in that case, this very far credential would benefit from the assurance level, which is defined in the EIDAS regulation. And depending on the context, it could be uh, supporting, uh, it could be a very far credential associated to a, a key which produces qualified signatures or advanced signatures. So these are this is a very interesting space to be able to have these legally enforceable or more legally enforceable credentials reusing the uh, the current EIDAS and it would work in 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 the context of more than 30 uh, member uh, European countries right now. The second use case is to use qualified certificates to support verifiable claims. Um, and legal evidences with full legal value. Here, what we are doing, and this is called the EIDAS Bridge initiative inside the EBSI project, what we are doing is to sign or to seal properly. We are sealing a, a verifiable credential uh, using the electronic seal uh, owned by the issuer. For instance, if I am a university, and I'm willing to issue a verifiable credential saying that Nacho uh, has a degree in law, what I can do to produce, to give this credential with more legal value, a bit more legal value, is to include my seal on the credential. Therefore, the identity of the university issuing this credential, which is asserting that Nacho has a diploma, it is based directly on the law. So instead of having to create a governance framework specifically to define who is uh, authorized to act as a trusted issuer, something that you can see in the sovereign framework, for instance, then what you do is to just reuse the EIDAS framework. So instead of uh, this university having to be authorized previously as a trusted issuer by the owners of the network, instead of that, uh, the university just uh, seals the credential with the qualified the qualified electronic seal based on its qualified certificate and therefore we have a specific legal effect directly applicable to this uh, verifiable credential this is uh, a very interesting topic uh, because uh, it could uh, allow to widen the market and open a new activity for the true service providers because at the end of the day, it is true that SSI is based on DLT, but this is uh, specifically something that has to do with control and autonomy. But when it comes to the issue of verifiable credentials, at the end of the day, you need a company or you need a body, a legal body that vouches and takes the risk and the liability for the information which is certified in the credential. And therefore, it is really similar to the, the, the legal regime of a true service provider issuing a certificate. So in the EIDAS bridge, what we are doing as a use case is to reuse the legal value and the legal effect 
associated to an electronic, an advanced or qualified electronic seal of a company or a body to enhance the legal value of a very foul credential instead of relying this into the network governance. So in that sense, this is quite different from uh, other approaches such as sovereigns, which are of course good. I mean, I'm not saying that one approach is better than the other, but uh, they are quite different. And this is because in the states you won't uh, find, you will not find uh, anything such as the EIDAS regulation as per today. They, they just have some specific sectoral approaches such as this federal PKI, uh, which is quite good, but it is, they don't have this uh, sector big, big, big regional approach dealing with the legal effect of documents. And at the end of the day, a preferred credential is a document. And another use case is precisely using a verifiable credential based on SSI system, precisely for identification purposes according to EIDAS. This, this is a more innovative approach. The first use case was taking a national ID card to get a verifiable credential. This, is, this case is the other way around. In this case, what I'm doing is to use my verifiable credential to identify in my relationship with a different government. Instead of using my national ID card to access a, a Belgian public service, I will be using my verified credential issued by the government or by a true service provider or self-issued using a national ID card as an ADAS identification means to access this Belgian public service. So here the discussion is purely legal. Uh, our, our current legislation is uh, true, uh, it is truly neutral from a technological perspective, but at the end of the day, in the implementation level, there is a body which is called the EIDAS Cooperation Network, which, were, which is formed by member states and the European Commission, that uh, decides, I'm not being right, really precise right now, but Roughly, it is true that they decide uh, about the technical specifications that must be used when uh, operating an authentication, electronic identification scheme um, and providing authentication services in, in the context of the EIDAS. So they have defined an EID profile where the, the, there, there are protocol considerations, there are syntax considerations, everything based on SAML. So this is nice. But uh, nothing in the current regulations uh, should prevent the usage of a new system based on uh, SSI, for instance. In this case, what we should do is to approve new technical specifications. That means that in this case, if the EIDAS Cooperation Network would be keen to approve these technical specifications, it would be possible to notify electronic identification means according to EIDAS, which are effectively SSI credential systems. So in this case, uh, we are innovating really the system. We are getting rid, in this case, we would be getting rid of the SAML use case. And here uh, we would start seeing the benefits of using SSI in, in, in public sector. So it is interesting because as the authentication infrastructure is moving from a platform run by the government at its own cost to the network, it would uh, facilitate also the uh, extension of this system uh, for trans doing transactions with private sector entities because uh, this private sector entity would not be connected to the government directly relying on the government infrastructure and it, probably having to pay some, something for that to be able to authenticate uh, their users and this is important because uh, you know that uh, uh, scalability of platforms are very important for banks, for instance, and in many cases they don't want to rely on a platform which has been designed by a government just for public services because the risk is different. So probably moving the authentication into the network would uh, imply uh, uh, yeah, that more banks could, uh, if they rely on the network, of course, use these uh, solutions. So uh, here we, we have a really really, really an, an, an innovation. It is the, the, the biggest innovation we've seen in the, in the first part of our work. And we are right now uh, drafting a report that will be circulated to European Commission, of course, for their analysis approval or disapproval, um, explaining how to do that from a legal perspective. Because we think it could be a, an interesting topic even in light of the review of the EIDA regulation we are, uh, they are starting to do right now. And finally, the last use case, it is the usage of blockchain plus uh, an SSI identity system 
as a, as a kind of electronic registered delivery service. This service, this is a true service, which is um, basically uh, making it possible to transmit data between third parties, electronic data. And it is interesting because uh, this data is uh, a legally proof uh, data. It means that uh, the system provides evidence related to the handle, handling of the transmitted data, including proof of sending and receiving the data, and that protects the transmitted data against the risk of law theft, damage, or any authorized trans alterations. This definition means that it is uh, a service that it is embodying a secure communication service. So here you have a legal institution which is um, providing a legal effect for the data which is sent and received using this secure communication service, which is to enjoy a presumption of the integrity of the data, the sending of that data by the identified sender, it's received by the identified address and the accuracy of the date and time of sending and received indicated by the qualified electronic registered delivery service. That means that if we take a, a, a network which has the possibility of uh, deal with transactional services, and we know that you know that there are a lot of networks being able to do that, partly on-chain, partly off-chain. If we qualified a service based on this distributed technology as an electronic registered delivery service, using, of course, very far credentials for the identification of the parties, then any transmission done using the service is presumed to be authentic. And this is, uh, you have to understand that for the lawyers, as me, this is really, really a benefit because we, we, we do not have to discuss in case of a claim in, in judicial claim, if uh, the com communication took place, because it is being presumed. So having this presumption is something which is really interesting. And as you can see from the legal text, this regulation is purely and completely neutral from a technological perspective. So probably if there are people worrying, worried about how to use the blockchain to conduct transactions with full legal value, they should look carefully at this uh, part of the AIDA regulation because it's perfectly feasible to do it. So finally, as conclusions, um, we found um, that the AIDAS is an appropriate regulatory framework to embody, for instance, uh, the specific SSI solutions uh, where it comes to the issuance and sharing of verifiable IDs for a, verifiable credentials for a electronic identification, clearly. So it is feasible, in our opinion, from a legal perspective, to create an SSI solution which is aligned with the Azure level uh, substantial, even high, but uh, it will be depending on this setup, um, which means that we could go for uh, the approval, for the proposal, the approval of uh, new specifications for, for, for a specific type of um, interability network for electronic identification, which means that uh, we could then notify these uh, verified credentials and they would they would immediately be effect, uh, accepted by the member state public bodies. That means that uh, we uh, effectively would be able to use these credentials in our relations with all the European administrations. And it would be then possible for private sector uh, companies also to accept these credentials depending on the uh, rules set forth by the member states. Of course, it might be convenient to slightly modify the implementing acts that means the second layer of legislation but uh, changes are really 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 few then uh, we've also found that the EI does, does not regulate all the EID stuff itself it just regulates the interoperability and uh, cross recognition of this EID so there are lots of things that probably will be dependent on national legislation so that means that we have to work on also with governments to try to help them to understand the the the, the regulation they have to produce in their legal in the, in their in their legal jurisdiction for instance there are uh, a list of topics. For instance, it is up to a member state to decide if a notified verifiable ID would be uh, would be authorized to authenticate uh, in banks, for instance, or the possibility of delegated verifiable credentials to different holders. This is a purely legal topic to be discussed with member states or to propose uh, as, as modification of the legislation for the future. Of course, when it comes to minors, incapable persons, or the legal regime of issuance of usage of these very far credentials must be defined in that level through legislation or through interpret interpretation of the current legislation. 
um, uh, traceability, for instance, uh, about uh, the interchange of verifiable IDs in case of uh, uh, crimes, for instance, crime investigation should also be defined by by member states in the legislation. And thus, we think that probably it could be convenient to widen the legal scope of the EIDAS to, to, to harmonize some of these problems. It could be an accelerator for, for the future. In any case, uh, another finding is that EIDAS is not currently an appropriate legal framework for all types of verifiable credentials. For instance, EIDAS does not rule the acceptance of a diploma because this is ruled in their own legislation. So we think that it could be an opportunity to extend this regulation to schemes for the self uh, so the self sovereign uh, management of identity attributes different from identity, for instance, diplomas or whatever other attribute we want to share, because we could reuse the legal infrastructure to, to have the to reuse the same trust framework. Um, thus facilitating the, the adoption. But of course, it will be it will require major changes. So in our report, we will be proposing this. And, and of course, it, it is up to member states and the commission to, to consider this as an, this policy input we, we plan to, to do. Of course, the immediate legal challenges are both considering what we can do as per today, which is really a lot, is to define the governance rules. If we want to put into production any SSI uh, solution and specifically a European SSI um, in, uh, interoperable solution, we should create an identity trust framework clearly. And of course, we should define a legal charter defining rights, obligations, liabilities of, of all, all parties uh, using this kind of solution. At the end of the day, again, this is about risk, identity process is about risk, about liability. And therefore, if we want to leverage uh, them in real processes, we have to define to define it, reusing the as much as we can the uh, legislation we have, which is really an opportunity. And finally, uh, I really do believe that this is a new paradigm for identity management. It is more privacy respecting. It's more more secure if we implemented it well, of course. And this is a topic for a different discussion, which is about the software security. You know. It is more flexible than we have today. It is the best. It is a mixture, uh, an eclectic mixture between PKI and, you know, the legacy authentication, SAML, and OpenID style approaches. And it will really allow, if we do it well, to to, to share the user to share and the total control the identity data, both for identification and for other uh, legal purposes. I think that uh, it will uh, allow the to to move from the data feudalism paradigm we, we have today, for, especially from this thing that has been called um, by Shoshana Thabov, for instance, the civilian capitalism to the task of control, which is uh, interesting because it comes from the European, from, from the, you know, from the United States, but it is perfect according to GDPR. We think that it can help the development of decentralized processes based on blockchain. It will help to new forms of currency, electronic payments, titles, transfers. And uh, of course, uh, for this uh, this promise to, to to be realized, we need to able to trust the data which is conveyed using SSI-based verifiable credentials. And for that, we have to comply with regulation. We can reuse substance costs, that's fine, and, but uh, we, we have to set forth the system. And therefore, we we expect uh, European Commission to take all this into account uh, and well try try also try to convince the community, which is you, to give support to this kind of uh, subset of verified credentials. In any case, uh, there are uh, lots of materials around identity for this in the context of this uh, of this work. I'm citing just some some examples. There are one uh, paper I was referring to before when we. We, I was talking about the, the 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 airport use case for boarding gate uh, for boarding passes. There are some references to to the trust management thing in the regulation. You will see also a reference about digital identity uh, classic approach far by Phil Winley. And also, I, I want to talk about the, 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 the new, this new um, progressive uh, book that Alex himself with Ramon Reed are working on, on sub identity, which is something I'm, I'm having a look at. It's excellent. 
and I think it will become one of the main main uh, books uh, on on this topic. So from my part, this is uh, more or less what I wanted to explain. Sorry, because probably I've been uh, more extensive than required. But now it, 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 we, we have some time for, for your questions, if, if any. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nacho. I, I think this was excellent and um, it's, it's great to have your time. Um, this question here from John Phillips, um, who presented actually last Friday um, from Australia. And he's asking, um, his first question is about how, how do you see the trust framework aligning with the, with the trust of IP initiative currently on uh, an RFC under Hyperledger Aries? Well, um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the uh, I've been having a, I've uh, I've been studying more or less extensively the the approach of uh, the Sovereign Foundation and and now the the approach of Hyperledger Aries, and I think that the 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 main difference is the fact that um, the, the way we plan or the way we could plan, I'm going to be prudent right now, the way we could propose um, the management of the trusted issuers. So one of the, 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 the legal differences between the European model and the, and the hyperledger areas now, or sovereign model, is that we we think that the public administration should have a role in deciding who is authoritative to issue um, any specific kind of credential when related to data. For instance, we don't feel, and but I have to admit that this is a very personal opinion. Uh, some of, of us are not quite comfortable with the idea that a public university or even a you know a public a government from the European Union um, is not able to be a, to issue credentials because they do not qualify according to a, a private sector scheme to act as a trust anchor or a trusted issuer. So probably uh, one interesting topic for us is to explore, and this is about the EIDAS thing, if the trust framework should not be based on the cooperation of between the member states because the function of the member state could be precisely to this, to, to, to grant and to intervene when someone is accessing to the system to e start issuing credentials. So from that perspective, the role that right now is being um, is being uh, performed in in the sub at least in the sovereign model I was studying by the at the end of the day by the stewardships by the by the, the owners of the network. We think that in the European Union should be complied by the governments themselves, and it should be regulated by public law. Probably this is a big uh, difference between our models, but I don't think this difference is uh, problematic at all, because at the end of the day, it is about the, well, the, the, the fact that we have different approaches in the world uh, for, for, for the governance of, of, of identity systems. The EIDAS is a public law approach. Other approaches are based on private private law, so probably we will need to compare both systems. And if that systems are to be intercommunicated, probably we will need to uh, have a look at common rules, which is something we could be doing, uh, reusing this uh, ANSI trial model law, for instance. But uh, yeah, here we will need to to have a look at how things develop in the future and then probably discuss about uh, legal interoperability between differently managed systems. Excellent. Um, um, John, he's also saying, um, this is an, an invitation actually, would you be able to participate in a sovereign guardianship working group? Um, this working group started last year. Uh, anyway, in any case, I can connect to both of you later offline if you're interested. Not sure. Okay. Um, okay. And then more questions. If anyone has any questions, please intervene now. And then we have Leonard, he's asking, is it possible to have an SSI without a blockchain? Yeah, of course. I think I think, I think think the answer is yes. I, I mean, you need a DLT, but uh, you, you can imagine a DLT which is not a blockchain. So yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I don't think it is possible to have a, a, an SSI without uh, without a distributed uh, solution in support of the deed. So, 
that, that's the point. You, you need, I mean, it, it is in, inherent to the definition of a decentralized identifier. So probably any decentralized system might be okay. But uh, if you take out this uh, decentralized system out of the story, then it is not. In, in fact, uh, I just want to, to say here that uh, I, I said I said it uh, in, at the beginning. I am co-editor of the new uh, ISO TC307 technical report on overview of DLT, ident um, DLT systems for identity management. That means that we, in this report, what we plan to do, what we are actually starting to do, in fact, it is to collect experiences where identity management is based on a DLT. That includes, of course, SSI solutions, but uh, you can imagine identity management sol centralized solutions, uh, which are uh, using uh, the DLT or blockchain for, uh, for some purposes, for instance, for traceability or for, you know, the assurance of the uh, or the trail or whatever. So in this report, I'm sure we will be dealing with uh, different use cases for DLT. And uh, one use case is, of course, in support of uh, self-sovereign identity, which is, in my opinion, the most interesting one. But I'm sure we will having we will receive um, also contributions where there are centralized or delegated classical delegated authentication. Uh, identity solutions which are using DLT for other purposes. Excellent. L last question coming in here from Michael. If anyone else has any question, please bring it in. Um, Michael is asking, um, I mean, you've been highlighting a little bit your vision already. How do you imagine SSI will be implemented in the European Union? Well, um, um, Probably the, 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 by my experience, because I, I was involved in the many many years ago in the in the stock project that uh, gave birth to the to the EID component that currently is used used in the EIDAS framework. Probably the answer is it will be implemented in the way that it is decided by member states. So probably uh, what we are doing right now, and and you know that the, there is the European Blockchain Service uh, Services for Infrastructure. Um, initiative going on. There, the, the, the member states are discussing um, around uh, reference architecture for an e-electronic uh, European self-sovereign identity framework. So, in that case, the, the, there are discussions about how the architecture of the solution should should be, how it should should should, should like um, should look like. Um, which are which should should be the pieces of the infrastructure, but they are doing this in in a neutral perspective. So they try not to define a closed solution. So which is the 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 challenge in my opinion? The challenge is that at the end of the day there will be competing solutions. So I think that the member states at the end of the day will end by defining in a very specific and detailed way, the upper layers, for instance, the syntax of a verifiable presentation or, or, or of a verifiable credential specifically designed for electronic identification purposes. And probably they will be uh, keen to leave more space in the lower layers. For instance, the, 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 the selection of the network when, where we are anchoring the deed if we have an interoperable solution to anchor in different networks. So at the end of the day, probably this is a very complex topic and the member states will need to address it from an intervalid perspective. And for this, I'm sure they will end up by defining detailed technical specifications, at least at the upper layers. And probably, again, they will be um, they will be able to leave more freedom to market in the lower layers because uh, of this uh, lowered approach. But uh, this is something in, in construction. Uh, it, it would be really interesting to recover the, I think one of the SSI meetups you, you did with Daniel Dusil and, and Carlos Pastor, they are the co-combinos the co of the SIF use case. I think they, in, that, in that sense, they would be able to explain a bit more um, this, this vision. But uh, everything is subject to, 
uh, whatever the member states uh, design jointly, because this is about consent. So probably just as uh, the current SAML solution uh, required a long process of generating consent and then deciding on technical spe specifications and deploying infrastructure, I think the same will happen with the SIF approach. And this approach, if uh, successful, could pave the way for, for future uses also in private sector. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we have a final note here from Wilm who's saying thank you very much, Nacho. Okay, so we forwarded that. Um, Nacho, any final thoughts you would like to share be before we close off? Oh, well, um, I, again, that uh, probably my final thought is that uh, we are in a very interesting moment. I mean, this is uh, an emerging technology and this from the perspective of uh, the fact that we have competing technologies, competing, in com competing implementations. Um, it is interesting for me that uh, we understand that we should be reusing the, the experience, the knowledge, the, the legal structures we already have. So probably uh, instead of uh, starting from scratch, I, I want to encourage everyone to, to reuse wh whatever legal environment we, we, we already have, at least for, for the subsector of legally enforceable transactions based on, on identity. And of course, I want to invite everyone to contribute uh, directly or indirectly to both to the FCSF project. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. And specifically for the, for the uh, standardization initiative, we are involved in ISO, um, TTC, TTC 307. And thanks for the invitation, of course. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> It was my pleasure and as we discussed before I hope, I hope we will have many more sessions with you I, i've been really impressed with your background and all the way from pki all the way to what we have today with um, um ssi thank you so much for that and for everyone else um, just for your information um, we will have by the end of the month an, a, a webinar session with Rieks Joosten from TNO in the Netherlands, um, who will be pre telling us more about the latest stuff happening in the European SSI framework. So that's one of the things we're planning to do in, in the next three, four weeks um, with Rieks in, in, from the Netherlands. Um, upcoming next week, we have a webinar session where we will be presenting the decentralized digital identity repo for Iberia America, which basically means Spain, Portugal, and the whole of Latin America, the Spanish Portuguese speaking part of, of Latin America. Uh, we will be doing that next um, Tuesday, um, same time as always. So you can join this also online. And um, um, if you want to follow up on all the stuff um, and the video that we will be sharing and the presentation we will be sharing very soon in the coming 60, 90 minutes and that we just did with Nacho, just sign up to the newsletter at SSI Meetup or jo join the different social media channels where we are, like Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn um, and Telegram. And yeah, and I think that covers everything. You can learn about all this. We also have the session we had with Carlos Pastor and Daniel Duchet from Belgium about the ESSIF that you can check out on the website. And yeah, um, this summarizes everything. And I think the main thing is, thank you so much, Ignati, for sharing your knowledge with us today. It was a pleasure to have you with us and uh, we'll bring you to, to plan for more things that I think will be really interesting to learn more about what we can do for SSI. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks.